the almost last sentence that we're going to talk about. Action. And uh, then our last one is, uh, which is the sense of smell, of course. And we will not have time to talk about uh, taste. Normally they're coupled together uh, as chemical senses. And we will end up with, uh, we will end up with uh, the auditory system. Both of these I'm going to uh, teach. And we're going to give our advanced lectures, in this case on the pheromonal system, to your open show, which will give one hour. And then any uh, next case will give uh, one hour. I will talk about some basic stuff on the auditory system. And Eddie will give you a more uh, advanced version. OK, so when we talk about the sense of smell, it's a unique uh, sense. For many reasons, we will talk uh, about many of them as we go along. It's a sense that uh, in terms of uh, the human population has impact uh, most dramatically indirectly in the perfume industry, in the food industry, it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of money running there, but much less appreciation to the sense in terms of the, in the north end. This has been uh, such because uh, it did not seem as a main sense or as an important sense in human, you know, if our nose is clogged, it's not a big deal, we can go along uh, quite well, and therefore, as, as a result, the biomedical research community, which gives us <coughs> funding and the money to do the science, does not fund it as much as other senses like uh, vision and audition. However, you look at the animal kingdom in general, and some of us as biologists are interested in understanding you know, nature and animal kingdom in general, uh, the, sense of the, the sense of smell has a huge impact, in fact, in most, for most animals, and uh, in many animals much more than other senses. And although it has been degraded in primate evolution to some extent, uh, it still has it's still a, a very central sense, this uh, realization, because we are our animal models are sometimes not human, or in most cases not human, uh, this got more appreciation as we get along. Because if you want to understand the as no scientists, if you want to understand the mechanism of you know, perception, and behavior, etc., uh, it's very relevant to study the relevant senses. Uh, that said, some people, like Mount Sobel in the Weizmann Institute, uh, argue <coughs> very strongly that the sense of smell is uh, very critical and uh, good for humans. Uh, he has you know, some success in, uh, in showing that. This is just a classical example from one of his papers when he was still in Berkeley. This is the classical image of the hound dog. This is the hound dog that was running after uh, a dead chicken in the field. So the farmers here took the chicken, the dead chicken, and dragged her on the yellow line through the field and released the dog here. And you can see the smelling uh, pathway of this, uh, of the sniffing pathway of this dog and how he finds the chicken. And uh, a few years ago, you obviously know one of my students and I went to uh, very close by Jerusalem in the police station of the Shmawat Bull. Border police. They have a, a place where they train dogs to smell bombs and uh, drugs. And we visited there to see how they train the animals for our own research. And it was actually quite amazing to see how how these hound dogs, how these dogs can handle it. We'll talk about a little bit. Yeah, just maybe a take on dogs, but not too much. Anyway, human here he gave uh, his students uh, money to track odor of chocolate. Right. 
to uh, others and we are just as good, although probably not as, uh, as fast. Anyway, it's a long uh, going uh, uh, discussion with, uh, <coughs> with Noam about uh, how, how uh, important smell is for you. Okay? But you don't need to be a genius to know that it's more important for a dog, for a cat, Okay, great. We'll talk a little bit about humans as we go along. Not too much. Let's start with classical biology. And like I said, odors or olfaction is a classical uh, or very important basic sense across the animal kingdom. Salmon, uh, fish are an extraordinary example. And the uh, fish, the salmon, as you know, they hatch in uh, fresh water. They live there for, uh, they grow up for I think, something like that, but I'm not sure exactly on the, on the timing, but then they go to the open uh, sea where they grow further and mature, and then at the end of their life, about a year and a half later at sea, they migrate back to the uh, place that they were, they, they hatched. And uh, this is done by the sense of smell, and this is actually a very uh, classical example of odor infringement. They recall the smell of their uh, of their own creek where they came from. And this is uh, one of the nice papers, an old oldie from 1976, where they took uh, salmon and they grew them in their own hatcheries in uh, pools. But in their pools, when they when the baby salmon uh, grew up, they were grown with a uh, one of three conditions: either no smell, just fresh water. Or uh, two different smells, either morpholine or phen phenethyl alcohol, which is called uh, PA. So these uh, scientists grew these uh, fish in uh, pools and then they uh, put them free in this uh, lake in Lake Michigan and came a year and a half later, roughly, when they scented, they put the scent of these. Uh, Others M and PA in two specific river, rivers. Okay, they put PA in a, a river called Two Rivers Breakwater, and they put uh, the morpholine in a Little Manitoc River. Okay, these are two creeks. They had 19 different uh, creeks where the students uh, collected the salmon that came back. They were tagged, so they knew <coughs> they were one of these groups. And you can see clearly here that from the lake these uh, some uh, swam back and they are they are known for their you know they they, uh, they swim against the, the flow of the river and you can see the data here okay the number of uh, salmon they got in this river which grew in uh, morpholine sent in the pools 207 and very few uh, fish made a mistake and this is again a year and a half uh, later there's a memory of this odor in the fish that uh, they can go back to the same uh, small creek that they uh, grew up. And then later on they have some papers showing electrophysiology from the fish also that there are different uh, traces for the different odors. It's a nice story of memory. But again, just to give you a feeling of how deep olfaction goes in the animal kingdom. Okay. Uh, you, two years ago? Last year. Last year there was a science paper. Now we're jumping to humans. About how many odors or how good are we in uh, smelling? And this is a paper from the lab of uh, Leslie Hosshall and uh, in Colombia, published in Science, entitled Humans Can Discriminate More Than One Trillion Olfactory Stimuli. Basically, one of their, I'll jump one and go back, one of their figures in the paper was that previously, anecdotally, people say, you know, my grandmother, uh, the grandmother talk is that people can discriminate about 10,000 odors. That was previous assessments around here, and they claim people can now smell 1 trillion odors. And if you compare it to the known numbers of uh, tones and colors, uh, odors, uh, humans can discriminate many, it falls higher uh, odors and colors and tones. 
the way they, so that was the claim of the paper. The way they did this is to make mixtures of two, uh, they, they had a pool of 128 milligrams, and they made a few different experiments, basically making a mixtures of 10 milligrams and uh, just picking up randomly from the 128. So, and they make two, two uh, four different mixtures, one with no overlap between the different 10, okay? So you can have 10 to the 28 possible pairs of mixtures like that, and some others with 30% overlap, 60% overlap, and 90% overlap. In this case, for example, nine others would be exactly the same, and one would be from uh, two different ones. And the question is how well can people discriminate Mixtures, of course, it's easy to discriminate uh, A and B when there is no overlap, and uh, it's harder as uh, the overlaps, the overlap go, go gets closer. Okay. And they did this for a mix uh, 10, 20 randomly chosen, and 30 randomly chosen authors. Okay. And the results, you know, not extremely surprising. Uh, as you make the mixture harder in the 10, 20 components and 30 components, you get closer <coughs> to chance level, which is shown here in the dashed line. But what they claim is that, so all the red ones are, this is 26, I think, or something like that, uh, 36 uh, people that were tested on the different mixtures. You have to say whether it's the same or different mixture. And uh, it's uh, like a three alternative choice, so they get three two similar and one different uh, outlier, and they have to say who is the similar and who is the different. The ones in red could discriminate. Okay, so you can see that 90% uh, uh, a few people could, could do it, and uh, the easier it goes, the uh, easier it can be perceived. And based on that, they extrapolated that if out of 128 others and such and such mixture, people can discriminate above uh, 50% chance or something like that, then uh, we extrapolate that people can uh, smell uh, a huge amount of uh, potency. So that was last year, okay? You get 2014 paper. And this year, yeah. and we will deal with it very soon on how do we, we uh, classify others. Very difficult uh, question that we don't have a good answer to. If you ask a chemist, he can tell you that uh, there are 1,000 different parameters for a molecule that can be different, classified as different from another molecule. So basically you can plot these on you know, some kind of uh, PCA space or something like that and you know how far they are, these 128 of them. But here they just took a classical, I think, uh, alcohol, different groups of, uh, of uh, chemicals that smell perceptually different to humans and are from different classes. But the important thing here, just a nice anecdote, is that uh, later that year, in November, a few months later, Marcus Meister, which uh, came from, is from Harvard and now is in uh, Caltech, which is also a researcher in the field. He's mostly doing vision, but uh, he had a small detour in, uh, in others. In uh, Opachen, he uh, wrote a very aggressive <coughs> paper against that science paper. And I'll read you the abstract. A recent paper in Science Magazine answered this question in the affirmative. The authors reached that conclusion of one trillion other, after performing just 250 comparisons of two smells, for which about half could be discriminated. Furthermore, the paper claims that the human ability to discriminate smells vastly exceeds our ability to discriminate colors or musical tones. Here I show that all of these claims are wrong by astronomical factors. A reanalysis of the author's experiments shows that they are consistent with humans discriminating only ten of them. The paper is Extravagant claims are based on errors or ma on mathematical errors. You can imagine that insulting the less the Vosalab or the 
very dramatic. In fact, the gossip around it is that he reached those uh, authors and told them, you know, you made serious mistakes, and uh, they didn't want to, you know, retract the paper or something like that. So they had arguments about that. But it's a very interesting. We did this collab meeting. It's a very good exercise for uh, a young scientist. Also, you know, not to take every uh, paper to be very critical about papers. And he, he has all kinds of great uh, arguments. Uh, I mean, the most convincing one is uh, doing it the exact same analysis for vision and audition and showing that basically we can discriminate infinite uh, number of uh, sounds and smells. So they fail the very basic uh, positive controls of their uh, calculations. But also that they have very uh, problematic uh, definitions of <coughs> other space and similarity between others. Again, just as this is, we're still in the intro introduction. Also, we have about six, I think eight hours to work. Mm -hmm. Six hours. Okay. Anyway, if you look in the literature, generally speaking, olfaction is a young tool. This is a little bit uh, old from the earlier uh, Candel one, but this hasn't changed much. In the newer version, if you look, how many pages are on olfaction in the textbook? About eight, while uh, almost a hundred vision, and if you look at the uh, uh, review from 1965 on, uh, in this case, olfaction in dogs, he says, who is this, Pitt, colleague, let us suppose in the very limit that we have utter chaos, 1965, 2006, Zach Manen and Rachel Wilson, the study of olfactory processing may no longer be in its infancy, but it has yet matured beyond stormy adolescence. <laughs> okay? So basically, what I want to say, to tell you, is that we are at a point where I have to uh, tell you that we're, you know, sorry, but we don't know much about the olfaction. And I'm going to tell you what we do know, to some extent, and we're going to sink our teeth into a little bit more advanced topics as we go along, and Seminoles, but relative to vision, we are still uh, years behind. And I would say mainly because of two things. One is what I told you initially, biomedical reason, money, cash. <coughs> the society wants to put cash, money, where biomedical research is uh, more relevant. And this has been a little bit less relevant for uh, human uh, biomedical research. The second one is our difficulty with handling uh, the stimulus. When we look at sensory uh, perception and sensory, the sensory field, sensory physiology, one very prominent uh, aspect of it is to know what we have, and, you know, what we're sensing. This is very obvious in some other fields. And in olfaction, it has been very difficult. And uh, interaction between us and people who know the, the stimuli, I mean the chemist, is very poor. So if you look at our collaboration with mathematicians, physicists, it's very good. We can you know, control stimuli very good, very strongly. I can today sit on my MATLAB in my office, write uh, an auditory stimulus, and it will be played in uh, San Francisco uh, with 100% accuracy. You cannot transfer smells very difficult to understand what is in the uh, content of a natural smell, okay? So we worked in our lab for a while and recorded natural sounds. So if you take a $10,000 microphone, you put it uh, on the top of the case, and you can record beautifully natural sounds. Very difficult to do this with uh, natural audits, okay? We are trying to do it. people have, but it's much, much more difficult, okay, the stimulus control. But the, the, the very basic problem is the same problem that we as neuroscientists face in all senses. We want to understand how does the brain uh, calculate or perceive uh, an odor and from there to drive uh, behavior, etc. Okay, this is a nice picture which I like. It shows both uh, the odor and perception. Okay. So first of all, other space is complex. 
complex meaning that were basically a little bit like what we asked before. We don't really know how to handle the different molecules. There are infinite number of molecules. How many exactly we can smell? I don't know. Somewhere between 10 and 1 trillion, probably, <laughs> based on what we saw before. And, uh, but in any case, if you do take a smell, any smell, and uh, break it down to its component, you know, you will always, or in most cases, you will get a uh, collection of different uh, chemicals. Roses, I don't know, are 250 <coughs> uh, components. Uh, urine uh, is 130. Uh, we studied pop odors, which had, I don't know, 90 something or 79 components. So it's a, it's a collection of different uh, chemicals. And in many cases, there are overlaps. But exactly how do we handle other space is still something that is highly debated and uh, we are uh, thinking about uh, as we go along these days. This is also referred to in the Meister paper, the poor way that we understand or don't understand actually uh, other space. Okay? This has been historically uh, defined by psychologists. So in uh, 1707, In this era, the psychologist uh, Carlos uh, Linneus defined that uh, odors can be categorized perceptually into seven different categories from, you know, champoferous, musky, floral, pepperminty, ethereal, pungent, putrid, etc. Or that's it. Okay? So this was good for a hundred years or so, and then came a different psychologist. No, it's not seven categories, it's nine categories. Is there an aromatic fragrance and what are the big fights between the psychologists on how we define it? And then Hans Henning, which was probably somewhere in between these guys, said, it's not seven categories. It's a prison of space. And it's any any other can be perceptually put you know, somewhere on the space. It's you know, a little bit twenty percent spicy. Uh, 70% flowery, a little bit fruity, etc., etc., and this is the way we categorize the others. Even to date, there are papers where, especially in the human, that uh, just to give the uh, reader the certainty that we're speaking with different others, then they give the human subjects uh, to define the others. So they will tell you that it's very sour, a little bit stinky, etc., or good, or flowery, fruity, banana like, whatever. There's a huge, uh, huge amount of classification. This changes as uh, society changes, and we become, uh, you know, Facebook, WhatsApp, uh, our, our vocabulary is beca becoming uh, different as we go along. Maybe uh, other space too. Anyway, so there one way to define other space is perceptual. Not sure it's the right way, but it's been uh, used all over. It doesn't tell us tell us much about the brain. Neuroscience, but nevertheless, this is something to keep in mind and that one finds in papers today. Another one to uh, do it a little bit more seriously or scientifically is to look at chemical structure. So, people have been looking at you know, classical things from organic chemistry. Rest assured that your organic, organic, <coughs> organic chemistry is better than mine, or at least uh, fresher in your uh, memory. So I don't know much about that, but you know, the branching of a molecule, the number of uh, cyclic molecules, the number of carbon atoms, uh, the number of uh, saturating bonds, uh, you know, functional groups tethered to the molecules, etc., etc., etc. And one can fairly easily say that if it's exactly the same molecule but has one more carbon, another carbon, another carbon, so you can maybe put it on some linear scale. Okay, this has created a lot of problems because, because perceptually it can be very different. Okay, so you can change from uh, three carbons to four carbons, let's say in aldehyde, and it maybe can smell very differently, and it does in many cases. So is this a continuous scale or is it not a continuous scale? Again, life is much more uh, comfortable or we are on more solid grounds when we speak about audition and uh, vision. So 
okay, but we cannot easily characterize uh, the chemical space of all this. In fact, if you go into a MERC, there are now online uh, chemical books and uh, databases on molecules. Like I said, you can find something like 1,400 descriptors of each molecule. Not only the carbon chain length and you know cyclic whatever, but you name it. The temperature of the you know, diffusion at this temperature, diffusion at that temperature, uh, melting point, eigenvector value of the carbon versus the uh, you know endless. I mean, it's you get a headache from that. And what people did, and again we go back to Noam Sobel in the Weizmann Institute, who is arguing very strongly that all I'm saying now to you is rubbish, and all molecules can be nicely organized on a single uh, axis. And this axis is a perceptual axis, which he, which he refers to as <coughs> pleasantness, from very pleasant on one end to very non-pleasant on the other end. And what they did, and uh, Noam has been, again, pushing this very strongly uh, for several years now, is that Again, the primary dimension of olfactory perception is pleasantness, from the unpleasant to the very pleasant. And what he did is we he took odor, odors, and classified them with PCA from the database of all this organic chemistry. So taking each other, classifying it by these 1,400 descriptors, plotting many others on a, on a line, and telling the PC, asking the PCA to plot out the most uh, the, the value that describes most of the variants in the different molecules and then plot them on a on an, uh, linear axis and then he did tests with people and asked them how does this molecule smell on this axis and he finds a correlation between the PCA of the chemical information out of the 1400 descriptors to the perceptual, uh, to the perceptual uh, decision or on this axis of pleasantness of, uh, of, of perception. Okay, so he claims, or his main claim is that there is one axis of uh, other space, it's pleasantness, and you can see this in the uh, chemical structure using PCA. If you look closer at the data, and you will also admit it, then there's nicely, there's something there, clearly, <coughs> but it explains only 30% of the variance. There's still 70% more of the variance to be explained, and of course, if you look at, and this is true for large scale, uh, if you look at large scale across many, many others, but if you look at fine scale, you cannot say, I don't know, if you put a banana versus apple, they would be close on the scale and uh, this axis cannot be, ex or the vari uh, variation cannot be explained when you get to a higher resolution, so to speak, in order to and Nevertheless, this is what he uh, uh, claims, so this is something you should keep in mind. Yes? So I, I'm not sure it makes sense to call pleasantness a, like, the gamut of sure of a perceptual axis. Pleasantness is something that you, once, once you already have a perfect, so then you, it, then you define the working space that we work in, okay? If we get a molecule, how can we define, you know, this molecule within this space? What Noam claims is that I have a space. I can define <coughs> it anywhere on that space, and it's both true chemically and perceptually on this, uh, on this axis of pleasantness. pleasantness. He doesn't say, you know, how can we know it's banana, or not uh, other person this you know, has to do with uh, things which are deeper based on memory, I don't know, experience, blah, blah, blah. 
but the very basic, very, very basic other state has one perceptual axis and uh, this axis has a good correlation, which I'm telling you is not good. It's good for studies in psychology, but not in natural sciences. Uh, very uh, noisy, and very low, no, it's not a, you know, an R square of one or something. It's very much poorer, but still significant. But that's his claim, okay? I, I don't think he claims that he can, you know, he, know, he knows how the nervous system perceives bana banana or apple, but it's a useful way. So if one wants to construct the experiment I talked before, like the 128 others, go to non space and choose your uh, others that they will uh, characterize the whole other space. Or look at uh, close by others versus uh, further away others, etc. So I don't think we are in conflict. I'm just saying that his claims are limited and uh, you know, you just need to look at the data to evaluate it. But generally, he says, you know, I can explain. A correlation between one and two. Okay? So this is where we stand currently. Like I said, very poor. Maybe a little bit better than what the psychologists, uh, you know, a few hundred years ago were, but, or a thousand years, but not much. Boom. So let's start with biology, with the real thing, okay, that we can really measure. And let's see where we are at. So we're smelling through the nasal epi epithelium, that is the sensory organ, it sits in the oral cavity. And uh, we are actively breathing, and this is uh, considered an active sense, uh, similar to vision, if you will, at uh, you know, saccades and changing the, where the focus are, or the whisking of the whiskers, that they have some kind of a pattern here too. Animals breathe freely. But odor comes into the brain in packets. So this information comes in packets. Of course, we can change. We can modulate the rate of sniffing, and we do, in fact. We can modulate the uh, intensity of sniffing, I mean, the duration, the number of sniffs, the frequency, etc. But generally, we sniff in uh, odorants, and there is some uh, opening also to the uh, oral cavity to the tongue. So, you know, some flavors that we eat can sometimes go up to the others and there are some interactions between uh, smells and taste. Like I said, we will not talk much about this. But basically, our sensory organ for olfaction is the uh, nasal epithelium. If you look at the nasal epithelium in the microscope, this is the classic uh, textbook stuff, you can see uh, that we have a layer of mucus on the outside. And then uh, there are in the olfactory, the olfactory epithelium is made up of three types of cells. Very big cells called supporting cells, which basically nourish the neurons and the mucus with all the goodies that it uh, has to have. In between, there are basal cells, which are stem cells, which reproduce and make new neurons. And basically, this is one neuron that is regenerated and sends its axon to the central uh, nervous system. And there are stem cells here. We think that it's because they are in contact with the outside world, like you know, skin cells and other cells that have the capability to reproduce. In between, nested in between the supporting cells are the olfactory receptor neurons. In my talk, you will see these as olfactory sensory neurons, OSNs, or olfactory receptor neurons, ORNs. And these are the neurons that collect the information around us of the uh, odorants, of the odorant molecules, and transmit this information to the brain. In fact, unlike any other sense, these olfactory receptors have, on one hand, their dendrite is in the outside world, swimming in its mucus. On the other hand, their axon is in the central nervous system. All other sensory cells have local connections. The receptor cells in the retina, in the skin, etc., they will have the receptors, but they will transmit via synapse locally their information, which only then will transmit to the brain. These cells actually have an axon that uh, goes, transfers through 
holes in the bone and send the axon inside into the central nervous system. In the mucus, you know, some people say there are uh, olfactory binding protein, uh, odorant binding proteins that help like chaperone the molecules uh, to the dendrites. And if you take one of these uh, epithelia to the microscope, you see it's, uh, it's shivering, it's dancing, it's like a jelly. Okay? When you look at it in the microscope, it's moving, and it's these cilia which are beeping all the time. And then asynchronous map. Okay. And uh, this is a real image from a microscope, of course, this is, uh, you can match it to the cartoon. The olfactory receptor neurons look like these small, you know, the two teeth brush that has the automatic one with the small uh, turning around the hair. So this is how it looks like. It has this uh, small uh, hair-like bundle of dendrites on the end. And the cerebral cells and the axon go uh, that way. And then there are these basal cells, round small cells, and these huge big supporting cells. And if you look from the bottom, you see many, many of these brushes. And uh, as I told you, if you took it, take it to the microscope, it's uh, dancing. Okay, odorants. We have, uh, you know, in human nasal epithelium about 2.5 centimeters square, about 5, 50 million sensory receptor cells, or uh, these olfactory receptor cells. Like I said, the cilia is beating asynchronously. There is continuously a new supply of these uh, cells, so the lifetime of the, each olfactory receptor neuron is about a month, and a month or up to two months. Actually, some with some evidence that some cells last forever, but there is turnover with an average of about a month and a half. Okay, so these are constantly renewing, which in fact, because they send their axon into the CNS, creates an amazing uh, developmental story that these axons have to find the right place continuously. So all the time there are new axons, new cells made, and they send a new axon to the factory bulb and they have to find the right place and this is actually one of the models to study uh, axon navigation uh, in the brain the factory system is a, is a great model for that for other reasons which we will touch upon later okay we cannot smell all molecules although we don't know how many molecules we can smell uh, we know that we cannot smell molecules uh, which are larger than 300 in their uh, molecular weight they must be volatile, they are normally lipophilic. No. We can also smell other molecules via the other sensory systems that we have, which, we'll, which we will talk about uh, soon, and you all make sure we elaborate on, on the demoronasal system of the pheromone. Okay? Great. Okay, so, yeah. This is, again. This is relevant mostly for <coughs> mammals with the mucus, etc. If you look at, you know, a fly, then it has uh, other rece receptors on its antenna, and then maybe they can detect other molecules. But today there's no known odorant, and I will talk about this problem as well, that we know of that are larger than 300 molecular weight that we can perceive, let's say mammals. There are larger molecules, again, that one can perceive in other, through other ways of the olfactory systems, but not the main olfactory cells. Okay, let's start. And as good physiologists, or neurophysiologists, we start with an electrode. And we stick our electrode into the receptor cell and blow odorants on it. We can order in uh, sigma, you know, because the food industry is full with odorants, people put as flavors in, uh, in food, okay, just to uh, give you uh, an intuition and to wake you up from the heat. Coffee, for example, that you buy, you know, uh, taste of sweets, etc., it's all a lie. <laughs> they take the coffee, the bean of coffee, they break it down, they dry it, and it has no odor at all. And then they add to it artificial odor. Of course, they add a beautiful couple in the morning when it's 
raining outside, it's very muggy, and you know, there's a fresh scent of coffee, but those are all lies, and it's all, you know, secret uh, patents of the companies, perfumers, and, you know, food companies that they add the specific flavor. They try to make it similar to real grinded coffee. If you take real beans and grind them, they do have a natural flavor, but all the Nescafe is all the big lies. Okay? Anyway. Let's take an electrode in our olfactory sensor neuron and blow some odor on it. And uh, what you see, what you see, what you get is you get the <coughs> depolarization and spark. Okay, so this is where we were many, many years ago when people studied the olfactory receptor neurons and how they respond to odors. One thing that was clear is that the molecule cyclic AMP in these cells is involved in the activation of these cells. So when you play an order to olfactory receptor neuron, this molecule, cyclic AMP, which you probably know, if you learn biology, you certainly know, is going up in these cells. So this is something that people knew at that time, in the late uh, 80s, 90s, this was the uh, bone tone, the main, main, main signaling pathway in, uh, in biology. And therefore, because when you give an odor cyclic AMP goes up, the receptor for the odorant must be cyclic AMP related somehow. And therefore, it should be probably a classical seven transmembrane domain protein. And people are starting to search for the odorant receptor. As you know from vision, in vision we have four receptors, one for intensity, three for color. And here they were looking for the odorant receptor. Lots of work was put into the uh, study of, uh, of the other receptors, and meanwhile they were breaking down the pathway, okay, from cyclic AMP, which cascades it amplifies, and in fact it amplifies a cyclic nucleoca nucleotide gated channel, okay? So when cyclic, let's say an order binds to the receptor, whatever it is, this activates some cascade, go, uh, cyclic AMP goes up, and opening cation channel. Okay, and in fact, when you knock out these channels, uh, you knock out, you make anosmic animals, when you make a knockout mouse, mouse of this specific channel. So in all receptor neurons, it converges from the other receptor through the cyclic AMP to these uh, cyclic nucleotide channels. In fact, they also have a specific uh, G protein here, G off protein, but we won't talk about that. But that's uh, all the sensory neurons go through cyclic AMP and this cation channel to depolarize the cell upon uh, other activation. Okay? This is just an example from a more recent paper of 96, uh, where they made these, not seeing these uh, channel knockout mice, and you know, they cannot smell at all. Mouse that cannot smell cannot really survive well, so they die very fast because they cannot find their mothers nipples to uh, drink milk, etc. But the search was on, okay? And before we go to, or let, give me a few more, two more slides before we go on, but the, the search was on for this odorant receptor. What is the gene, the protein, that encodes odorant in the olfactory system? And the people who, the person who worked on that is uh, Linda Bach, and she worked in Richard Axel's lab in Colombia. She just finished four years of postdoc in immunology, four years, had you know, fair papers, nothing dramatic, but good. And then she joined Richard Axel's lab to look for the other research. She worked eight years, an additional eight years, like a second postdoc of eight years, to look for this receptor. And what she found was amazing. And she found, and those who don't know, there's not one other receptor, there are 1,000 other receptors in the genome. And how many genes do we have in our genome? How many genes? Come on, I see a few students, you should know. How many genes in the human genome? 22,000, okay? Roughly exchanging it every time. Let's say 22,000. Out of 22,000 genes in our book, 1,000 is dedicated to olfactory receptors. 
This is no less than an amazing number. Okay? The only gene family that exceeds the odorant receptor is the immunoglobulin family, okay, of the immune system. And that makes sense because we have to fight. That's how much we put into the army of the body, so we have to put a lot of uh, machinery there. But the second largest group of genes in the genome is that of olfactory receptor. And so this discovery, which actually made a huge difference in, the, in how we know and understand olfaction, uh, Richard Axel and Linda Bach uh, got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of organ receptors and the organization of the nervous system. So this was a real break, breakthrough. In fact, I, have, I don't know if now we have these debates in uh, Gezi. Did we have a debate last year? Yeah, I think so. You were not part of it? This year, no debate? Okay, so yeah, because two years ago the debate was extremely fierce <laughs> to address this. Anyway, a few years ago I had a, uh, a debate with Hagar. The debates in Elsek are, are those that PI get to defend the position, and it has to be opposite than the other PI, and the two PIs fight in the same. <laughs> so I had a fight with uh, Hagar <coughs> Bergman. His claim was why the only way to understand no by no ne uh, neural circuits is by electrophysics. That was a guy's claim. And there's no other way. And I was claiming that how can you understand neural circuits without electrophysiology at all? And one of the examples was the, the example of, uh, of Axel and Bach. You know, people have been sticking electrodes into the brain for years trying to understand how, of course, the answer lies somewhere in between. Blah, blah, blah. And we hug at the end. Peace and love. Nevertheless, this is an example of really changing the way we think on, of how this system uh, uh, works. Now, maybe we'll take, uh, with this discovery, great discovery, which gives you probably shivers and great excitement, we take a 15-minute break, and we go back to uh, look at the genes and, uh, and uh, neurons and electrophysics.
Yeah, there are other chemicals, you know. <laughs> 
chemoreceptors in the stomach and things like that. But uh, other receptors is a specific family that you can find in the nose. They vary, this 1,000 uh, different uh, proteins vary mainly in regions around uh, where we think is the site of ligand binding. Uh, but that's just uh, some details. There's nothing critically important uh, in this slide. Okay, just that the, the transmembrane domains are conserved uh, <coughs> in the different uh, different 1,000 proteins. Another thing, if you look at where are these proteins uh, in the chromosomes, they're not clustered in a specific regi region. Rather, they are all over the place. So in chromosome number one, you can find such and such, there's actually a big uh, cohort of uh, factory receptors on uh, chromosome number 11, uh, but they're all over the place. So there's no specific logic to uh, where they are uh, in the genome. One important thing about these olfactory receptors is what we, they are what we call orphan. They don't have parents. What do we mean by that? Normally, Normally, if you look at the receptor, the membrane receptor, normally it has a ligand that binds to it. And if you look at the G protein coupled receptors, which the olfactory receptors are part of, many of them we know their ligand. For example, those of you who study physiology know noradrenaline, for example, and the beta adrenergic receptor, but we know that noradrenaline is the ligand and it activates. Here we have 1,000 proteins, and we don't know the ligand. We have an infinite number of ligands in the world, odorants, chemicals, but we cannot do the match. We don't know which odorant binds to which receptor. So when I started teaching this, the textbook said that we know about uh, 20. Out of the 1,000 receptors, we know only 20 which are the ligands. Now, current status is about less than 100, 60, 70. There are people working on this, and this, this arrow is growing every year, but we're roughly here. So, but most of the other receptors in the genome, we don't know which, uh, which molecule activates them. Okay, so we call them an orphan family of receptors. One of the main problems in de-orphaning a receptor, okay, is to be able to screen odorants. Okay, how can we know which uh, ligand binds to which receptor? We can maybe express them in heterogeneous systems. Okay, we can express them in some cells that are very easy to express. And then blow with a reporter and blow others on them. And then this way we can screen very similar way to the way they screen drugs. Okay? The problem with these receptors is that they could not go be trapped to the membrane. So people could not express them in a total system. They were expressing fine in the uh, receptor neurons, but if you just take a hex cell or any other cell in, in vitro, you can't really express them. So that was a big problem. In, nine, in 2004, uh, the group of uh, uh, Matsunami found two proteins which are actually chaperones that aid, so once you express these cells, they chaperone these cells to the membrane. And therefore, you can now start to study them in a modular system. So basically, this discovery in 2004 opened the opportunity to screen the, to start screening other receptors and trying to do this match of the orphaning between the ligand and the receptor. <coughs> and so that's where we stand. Actually, a few years later, they found two other uh, family proteins from the same family, which express even better. So now it's rather easy. So if your intention is to express other receptors and study, the, uh, study them in some way, this is a very important piece of information. What we know from this huge gene family <coughs> is a few things. First, now, nowadays, more and more genomes are cloned and published, so we know the genome 
with more and more ammo. Okay, very soon you can clone your own, you can uh, test your own genome, probably for uh, $100 or something. But we know now that there is dramatic change in the repertoire of genes between species. So the other receptors that flies have are not the same as we have. Maybe we smell the world differently. There's a large number of server genes. And there's a large variation within species. What do I mean? Let's look at a few <coughs> different species. So if you look at human, we have 950 receptors, olfactory receptors, not 1,000, 950. Out of them, 50% are not functional. Okay? So it means it's a receptor of genes, right? Genes, but 50% of them are cellular genes, which are not functional. Okay, there's some mutation in the gene, and the protein is not expressed and not functional. It's not expressed at all, right? Not functional. Okay? So we have only about 400. So the, the Nobel Prize they got was in Rodin with 1,500 of factory receptors in their genome, 20% of which are pseudo genes. So about, the number is about 1,200. We know today. Dogs have about 1,200. 100, the fossil is 1,500, platypus is 600, <coughs> and this is a, a review I just took from uh, last year. The more uh, animals that we can uh, screen, we can see the repertoire of olfactory receptors. The number one master is actually the elephant, and elephants have almost 2,000 olfactory receptors intact, okay? More than 4,000, but half of them are the genes, uh, cows, dogs, horses, rabbits, again, blah, 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 humans are last. 400, the last one is uh, intact, three, almost 400 receptors. Okay, that's the data. The analysis is all the time improving and improving, but that's the, the issue. So basically, we have a very, there is large variation between different species. It's an important point. get to it uh, later. The other thing is that there is large variation within species. And this is basically due to SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphism, in the receptor themselves. So for example, I have the gene, and you have the gene, but it's slightly different functionally. So let's say one amino acid is different. And this can cause differences in how we perceive and smell the protein. So this experiment was published in 2007, a nature paper. There is a well-known anecdote of people who can, who smell, uh, in this case it was androsterone, and say it's great smell, and some other people smell it and say it's stinky, stinky. Okay? So what they all did, they took the uh, sequence, the genomes from people, they took their, uh, from the cheek, you know, they and what they found is a very nice correlation between the, so what they did, they, first of all, uh, they, they're the ones who found the, the chaperone of proteins in the head. So they took, they looked for the receptor for androsterone, and they found which, which one is the protein that expresses, is the ligand, this is the ligand with which for factory receptor, okay? Then they took people, screened them for the uh, genes, and they found a very nice correlation between the perception and the mutation in the other receptor. Okay, so the people with the regular, uh, let's say, uh, alti, 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 doesn't really matter, but it's two positions of uh, amino acid on this receptor. If they smell androsterone, they would describe it as sickening. Okay, it's disgusting. And the ones with the uh, uh, specific uh, SNPs, there are two different variants, who describe it much less as sickening and much more as vanilla. Okay? So basically what they say is that if you look at the human genome, my receptor, other receptors, and your 1,000 receptors, there's large variation between species, and 
this may have an impact on how we perceive uh, humanity. Okay? This explains, I don't know, about 34% of the variance in the data. And a recent paper that was published last year, where I'm, I'm jumping a little bit, yeah, is this paper, I don't know, 2013, which found the most dramatic uh, difference in, a, in an, a, an odor called beta ionin. It's also an odor that uh, the food industry adds to, uh, as a flavor to other, uh, to, to many foods. And they did a chocolate test where they put beta ionin in, in, the, uh, in the chocolate or not and screened for the mutations in the receptor. And in fact, they found, uh, like, it was explaining like 90% of the variance in the perceptual data. Okay? So if you have this ver uh, version of OR5A1, that's an intact version, you think this is uh, good, you say this is a good smell, and if you have to sniff, you uh, say that that's a bad smell. Okay? The first paper showing the correlation was the 2007 paper, but not explaining all the variants, about 30% of the variants. And this one was explaining 95, 96% of the variants. If you look at uh, orthologs genes between species, so if you look human versus chimpanzee, you see that 70, only 70% 70 are indistinguishable. What they did here, again, the Matsunami is the master of these uh, studies, takes and expresses them in hexes, uh, flashes uh, orders on them, and gets a response. How res responsive these cells are? 17% are uh, identical, but all the rest are different. So there is very large variation between species. This is data from mouse and rat, and this is data from between individuals. Okay? So if I compare my genes my 1,000 gene repertoire to any of your gene repertoire, only 70% uh, uh, will be uh, identical, but 30% will be very different, and all kinds of differences. Including the pseudogenes? This is not including the pseudogenes, but some of them, out of my one, what, 400, 8% uh, will be pseudogenes in your uh, genes. Okay? 70% we share, but 30% are, are very different. Okay, so there is large variation of olfactory receptors within the genes. Now to the questions that we started to answer, uh, to ask me in the, uh, in the research. In the winter, okay, so how are they expressed in the olfactory epithelium? There are millions of cells here. And one of the next amazing discovery of Richard Axel's group was that each olfactory receptor neuron expresses only a single member from the 1,000, okay? So out of all the 1,000 possibilities that this neuron can express, <coughs> it expresses only a single other perceptor. All the rest of the 999 are shut down, cannot express in this single cell. And the evidence for that are two. One, if you... Uh, Make a mouse with, let's say, a receptor called M71 GFP and tag a GFP on it. And you look at the epithelium and you count how many cells there are. You find that only 0.1% of the cells express GFP. Which means, probably, if this is linearly distributed, evenly distributed, is that each neuron expresses a the second line of evidence is that if you pick randomly a cell from the olfactory epithelium and test what is the mRNA species from the family of 1,000 organ receptors that it expresses, you always find that it expresses only one from the 1,000. So together, these two pieces of data suggest that there is one neuron, one OR, or factory receptor complex. So each neuron will express only a single other receptor in the repertoire of one thousand. Yeah. Sorry, you can repeat my question. The 
the many things that happened higher, higher up. But we start from the beginning. Ah, no, 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 no. It's no, I didn't say that. I said that each receptor <coughs> neuron expresses one protein of, from the other receptor cell. That's what I said so far. And what does it mean in the level of molecules? Uh, we will soon see in a few slides. Yeah. Uh, I don't know much about genetics uh, or anything, but... Uh, about what? About genetics. Okay. But Pseudogen will not express. Yeah. So, so what's the explanation of the existence of pseudogen in general? What's the explanation of the existence of them? Yeah, why are there genes that are essentially not expressed during our lifetime? It's uh, <coughs> a payment of evolution, you know. We, there are mutations and with time they uh, are not functional anymore and new genes are becoming functional and incorporated and there are changes in genes and that's a qu an evolutionary question. We are not clean from pseudogenes. That's for sure. There's a lot of the DNA was considered junk, which now we we are uh, slowly discovering that it is not junk DNA, but it is somehow uh, in the re regular. <coughs> but these are the uh, real genes, are the you know, intact reading frames of uh, that you expected. Okay, if you look at the epithelium, actually there is some spatial organization. And it's, it's uh, divided into four different zones. People don't know exactly what these zones mean, but basically you can find in a given zone 250 neurons that express only one neuron receptor, but they are one of 200, a family of 250 different genes. So let's say from gene zero to 250, only in zone one. From 250 to 500, zone two, etc., etc. And inside the, the epithelium, they are scattered all over. So it's not like in the cochlea or retina where the position matters. It doesn't matter, but on a gross scale, there is some organization. We don't know what does this mean. We just know that if you stain for a gene, let's say the M71 GFP you saw before, you will find that only in this zone. If you make another mouse with receptor 753 with GFP, you will find it in this zone, etc. Okay, we don't know what it is. Yeah. No, but there is to develop to the development of the nervous system. We will not talk about this. Okay, the second station after the we're now leaving the epithelium and we're going up into the brain. And the first station of uh, processing is the olfactory bulb. This is the bulge here in the rat brain. In humans, this is this two dalle structures. Okay, under the frontal cortex, this is uh, an image from the bottom, and this is from the side, the two olfactory bones. As you can see, in the rodent's brain, <coughs> size uh, is dramatic, is uh, much uh, more significant. <coughs> I don't know what it means, you know, but never mind. The bottom line is that more machinery is dedicated to, uh, to olfaction. Like I mentioned briefly earlier, they're not what I told you only is about the main olfactory epithelium. There are actually four different olfactory organs. One is a rodents. very small what? Rodents. In rodents, yes. Okay? One that is called the Grunberg ganglion. It's sitting here right <coughs> next to the nostril. <coughs> it has only about eight hundred neurons and expresses uh, six different receptors out of the repertoire of myself. Another one is the VNO, a very famous organ involved in pheromones. Johan and Joe will talk about that more elaborately, which is used to encode pheromones. This is not exactly true, not the main also encodes pheromones, but we'll get into the details. There's a very uh, recent one which we don't know much about. It's called the septal organ of Mazera, very small one, uh, again, not expressing many uh, 120 ORs or so, and uh, we think it's 
responsible for mechanical stimulation, we don't know much, but we're going to talk mainly about the main of the system. Humans have more than one organ as well? No, you're humans, uh, you talk about that because there's a big fuss around whether humans have pheromones, okay? Every time you see the commercials of uh, apps on display, the male puts the aftershave and the, all the women run after him or something like that, or the opposite uh, way. That's all a lie, of course. Humans don't have a pheromonal system, a classical male pheromonal system. However, there are pheromon if there is pheromonal information going through the main olfactory epithelium, therefore, there is information that is transferred between people which has to do with pheromonal-like behavior. One classical example also comes from the lab of uh, Noam. Uh, in, uh, a few years ago, when Yair Lapid was still the anchor of the Channel 2 News, he started this uh, Friday night evening uh, session, the last item, after the commercial, and the item title was, Why are people crying? In the white man. That was the uh, head. Okay? And what Noam did, and I think one of our papers that we're going to discuss is uh, something similar, is he took uh, women and showed them uh, the movie, I don't know how you say it in English, you know this movie? Don't know the movie? You must see it. It's a heartbreaking movie. I was crying when I was a kid about the boxer and the little kid, the blonde little cute kid, that his father is dying in the boxing. Anyway, very hard to see. And he brought women into the lab and he took uh, epilogues and uh, showed them what? The Champ, yeah, The Champ. The movie is called The Champ, you must see it. And uh, he waited, he, he explicitly asked for women who are, who are why, why, you know, whining a lot. <laughs> and the students sat there and they collected the tears from the <laughs> students. What is that? It's a science paper. So each, each, each uh, participant, you know, the good participants gave uh, two milliliters of uh, tears or something like that. And then what they did is they gave it to a maid to smell while they did the MRI. And they showed the, the depressive sexual drive. <laughs> so crying woman depressive sexual drive. It was a science paper in the news. Anyway, one of the papers that we are going to discuss, I think, I don't know who is doing it. Yeah, you, okay. Is about tears in uh, uh, young animals which depresses the sexual drive in males. So males will not mount on young animals, okay? Because uh, they will wait for them to be uh, sexually mature before they mount on them. And in fact, what these Japanese group found is that in the tears of the baby, of the young mice, the teenage mice, there is this pheromone in the tears that uh, suppresses the sexual drive of the animals. But we'll talk about it. It's actually going through the beak, the VNO. Okay, anyway. Okay. Yeah. No, the humans don't have the, the vimeral nasal organ and these other structures. Classically, it was considered that pheromones go only through the VNO, therefore, humans don't have VNO. But today, we know that there is pheromonal like information, and how we define exactly pheromone, we, don't, we won't go into it, but you know, very quickly, it's a, it's a substance that triggers uh, behavior immediately uh, in the, within the same species. And you can find uh, these types of behaviors going through the odors that go drive behaviors through the main olfactory system. So humans think that, in humans, we think that there is some pheromonal like use that uh, go through the main epithelium. For those of you who haven't seen a mouse brain, sorry for the weak-hearted uh, theoreticians. <laughs> this is the head cavity of a rodent. This is the front tooth. This is the upper the what do you call it? Palate. Palate, the upper palate here. And this is the whole olfactory epithelium. You see it's like a striated uh, structure. This is one, when you look at it in, in the microscope, it's uh, like a jelly. It, uh, it dances. This is the main olfactory bulb, 
And basically, this, this the cortex here, and the, the brain will be something like that, and the brain stem here. So this is the brain, and all of this is the refractory epithelium. See how huge it is as compared to the brain. When animals sniff through the nostril, there is they go through this turbulent airflow, and goes in and out, <coughs> and hits the epithelium. Yeah. Central nervous system. Yeah. You are what defines the you are part of the, the the you have to be part of the brain. I don't know it. I mean, it's a standard thing. You're part of the brain. Yeah, it's an, an integral part of the brain. The central nervous system. This is not part of the brain. It sits on the periphery. So there is the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. When you say a nerve, it means that all the axons that are coming from the peripheral nerves. And this hits into the central nervous system. So it's protected, for example, by blood brain barrier? Yeah, so it's protected by blood brain barrier, it's in the, in the, in the cranium, it's supplied by ACSF from the ventricles, and it's part of the brain. for the next amazing discovery from the Richard Axel. So the first one we found that they're olfactory receptors, they got the Nobel Prize for. Second one was Peter Mombard working as a postdoc in Richard Axel's lab, finding one, one OR per olfactory receptor neuron, amazing finding. The second one is that when he made these mice expressing, in this case, some black staining, that allows black staining. This is all the neurons expressing a single receptor, okay, called P2. What he found is that all of these receptors coming from zone number two in this case converge their axons into a single point in the olfactory cortex. So all of the receptors, 0.1% of the cells that are scattered randomly in the epithelium, <coughs> all send their axons into a single point in the olfactory cortex. This point is called the glomerulus, and that's the meeting point of the axons of the sensory neurons with the dendrites of postsynaptic cells. However, you must see that there is an amazing specificity here. Th there are thousands of these, okay? And each one that are scattered all over, they have to find themselves and synapse onto a single glomerulus. So there is a remarkable wiring specificity of thousands and thousands of axons, about 15,000 axons, axons for each uh, olfactory receptor, that find themselves and their axons into a single bundle. So all of this data from the epithelium is converging into a single promotion. Okay, you can see it on the top. Let's say two different receptors from zone one, the red will send their axons to the red glomerulus, and the purple one to the uh, purple glomerulus. And as you can imagine, if you have 1,000 receptors, you have 1,000 glomeruli on in the olfactory Yeah. Um, would, this, this, uh, would this sound best in rodents or in humans? We we'll talk about that. It's a good question. This is true for mammals. It's also true for Drosophila. We will talk about Drosophila. And another question? Not in fish, for example. We'll talk about that. This is where computational neuroscience kicks in. Okay? But we have, I think, another hour or so until we get to the things you guys like. Like function, and device normalization, and gain of function, decorrelation. No, no, I sin as well. I do this stuff. Also. I listen to Ryan Kapolinski and Colin all the time. But, Zone receptors converge their axons into specific glomeruli. If you look in the olfactory bulb, you also can see these 
zone, which are also organized. It's mainly a developmental issue. These neurons will develop together. Like I said, we don't touch developmental neuroscience at all. This is something I teach in another course. But it's a, w it's a remarkable wiring program of how these axons find themselves and how they're organized together and how to make a nervous system. Just to keep in mind, let's not talk about that, but if you find in textbooks and articles, in fact, we don't have 1,000 glomeruli, we have 2,000 glomeruli, because these split into two different glomeruli on each side of the olfactory bulb. So basically, we have four glomeruli from a given receptor. Two on each bulb. They're organized in a symmetric manner. Those are also connected by uh, intrinsic connections, and it's important for oscillations, for the oscillatory behavior of the circuit, but we will not touch upon these connections at all. So just, as far as we're concerned, each glomerulus, each uh, olfactory receptor type sends its axon to a specific glomerulus. Moreover, these are connected in between the bulbs. So wiring specificity is amazing. One step further, not only do all the axons of M71 converge on a single glomerulus, each microcell, which is the post main postsynaptic cell projection room in the structure, sends a given dendrite, a single dendrite, into a single glomerulus, sends its axon, its axon to other structures, we'll talk about that later, also to the cortex, but there is connectivity between these cells and the glomerulus on the other side. Okay, this has been proven. It's a paper from 2008. The is post is after the Then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the post. These are axons in green coming in. I'll show you a beautiful image of this. Where is this? Huh? Here. Oh, not here. That's the things you like, the TCA. So this is the axon coming from the nose of the M71 mouse, GFP, labeled with the green fluorescent protein. You can see that they come from all over. This is part of, initially this is the part of the nerve, okay, the bundle of the axons. Then they split and they, you see all the axons here coalesce into a single glomerulus. These are the micro cells that send their dendrite into this glomerulus and receive it, uh, the information. No, no, those are 15,000 axons from 15,000 cells in the epithelium, which converge to it. So, or expressing a single receptor, specifically M71 in this case. And those 15,000 cells are different places in the epithelium? No, they're in one zone. We call them zone. We don't really know what they are, but it's pretty broad, about 25% of the whole epithelium. They're scattered there in salt and pepper. Then they converge their axons. An, an, again, an amazing developmental skill that they have. Yes. The microcells get information from each glomeruli, but they're all the same receptor. Like you have different glomeruli for each. Each receptor has a different glomeruli. Is a different glomeruli. And then it connects to the microcells. Yes. Connected only to this glomeruli. One glomeruli. They also have lateral connections. We'll talk about that, about lateral inhibition and all that. The glomerulus is, is a, an anatomical structure, doesn't have cell bodies, only axons from the receptor neurons and dendrites from interneurons and the microcells. But also axons may be coming from you know, top down, from other regions, etc. So it's like where the, all the axons converge? All the axons converge there, but they are the presynaptic uh, machinery. There's a lot of postsynaptic machinery in as well. And they, they look like uh, these structures these uh, ball-like structures, they're called glomeruli. Okay, so if we compare olfaction to vision, stimulus is chemical <coughs> versus light, uh, both of them work via g protein coupled machinery, uh, here it's 6 KMP, there it's 6 G. Did you work on the cell biology of the retina or the, yeah, I forgot some point. <coughs> here it's depolarization, you know, it's hyperpolarization of the retina, uh, it's unique that it uh, projects its axons to the brain, its action potentials, and about 1,000 olfactory receptors, which is very unique. Okay, let's go on with the anatomy. So, like I said, this is just another depiction of what I showed you before. Each receptor type sends all its axons to this glomerulus. Here, 
Now, what, you, what is important to know is that each glomerulus accepts axons only from a single olfactory receptor. Okay? One could have thought that another receptor type can convert also to here. But the axons that you find here are only from one other receptor, expression set. Okay? So basically, there is this uh, very, very clear cut anatomy, and again, not with a single electrode stuck into the brain. We know how these functional receptors are expressed and how they are, you know, converged or diverged in the nervous system. So it's a one-to-one -one function? Here, from the epithelium to the glomeruli, it's a one-to-one -one function. All the processing, the neural stuff, is beginning here. Okay? That's what we do in the lab. Okay. In 1999, Linda Bach opens her own <coughs> laboratory after discovering the, the olfactory receptor family. And now what she wants to ask is what does he ask? How does this translate functionally? And what she's doing, she takes 14 neurons, she's picking up from the mouse 14 neurons randomly. And because it's only 14, probably each one is expressing a different olfactory receptor. She places them on an in vitro dish and is doing calcium imaging to these cells in a petri dish. And she, what she's doing, she pours on these cells two, four, six, eight different odorants. These odorants smell, let's say this one smells fresh, rose, oily to the students in the lab. This is rancid, sour, repulsive, sweetly, fatty, etc. So she convinces the community that these are really different odors, although a few of them are acids, a few of them are alcohol, in this case half alcohol, half acid. Okay? <clears throat> Basically what you can see from this experiment, the cell picture, is that cell number one responded to these three of Cell number two responded to these three of Cell number three did not respond at all to any of the odorants, etc., etc., etc. And from this, what uh, Linda is uh, interpreting this data, as that these olfactory receptors are promiscuous. They, they respond, I mean, they express a single protein, odorant receptor, but this odorant receptor is responsive to many odorants, which creates what we call a combinatorial code. So now you can imagine that if a smell comes in, even if it has one component, okay? Let's say you take uh, octanum, which is a single molecule, and you play it to the nose, it will activate many different receptors. So it is the ligand of many, many different receptors out of the one cell. If you take a complex odor, urine, rose, excuse me for giving these two examples, but uh, something we... <coughs> uh, you see examples a lot of because they have many components. You can imagine how complex, what a complex activation pattern is in the olfactory field. Okay? So this is already from the start, not only from the world of molecules around us, but also physiologically starting to be a complex thing to, to understand and decipher. How does how is the code, this kind of code, read by the brain, brain next? And this is basically what we want to do in neurophysiology. So the concept is that uh, different odorants, basically, I mean this is what I just saw, told you, a single odorant will activate numerous receptors and so that's another uh, one concept and single receptors can recognize uh, multiple odorants that's what I told you before uh, this is what we call uh, the combinatorial code so okay, one will express this, uh, some will not the different odorants are recognized by different combinations of receptors that's indicating that the olfactory system uses a combinatorial coding scheme to encode and I, the identities of odors. Okay? And now we step into the nervous system a little bit more uh, seriously and we want to start simple. And when we start simple, we start with a simple animal. We have a representative here of those 302 neurons. Like I said, olfaction goes deep in evolution, and even in the C. elegans, uh, it uses olfaction as a main sensory cue to behave. Admittedly, maybe Aaron will uh, not agree, but 
this is not a very complicated animal. Its behavioral repertoire is limited. It can aggregate, it can go towards an odor, it can go away from the odor, it can swim fast and it can swim slow, but you know. <laughs> it cannot, let's say, let's agree, it cannot pass the uh, neural networks too of uh, time and the uh, Yonatan In this animal, however, these animals are used to understand basic concepts of nervous system and how they work. Okay? And in fact, the C. elegans have been a great animal in the study of in the field of olfaction. <coughs> and uh, just as a, as a classic example of a neural circuit, perhaps the most uh, famous person who studied this in, uh, in the context of neural circuits is uh, Cory Bergman, who's an amazing scientist, still very productive in uh, Rockefeller. She's actually married to Richard Axel. There was a lot of gossip, so they weren't married. She went to the Nobel Prize, his wife didn't, very sympathetic, lots of flavor <laughs> in this book. Anyway, see, and again, they have 302 neurons. We know the full connectome of this animal, which is very important. They have 100 olfactory receptors, not 1,000, but all of them are expressed in only three.